Obviously, if I've got Thor's powers now, I'm not really Jane Foster. This story will make you believe that Lady Thor is a better call sign than Thordis. Maybe, I don't know, maybe you love Thordis. Greetings comic lovers and welcome back to Casually Comics, the channel where we chat all things comics, from news comics new and old, history to anecdotes, really wherever our whims take us. The concept of Lady Thor is one that has raised some eyebrows, ignited arguments about whether Thor is a mantle, a title, or something intrinsically tied to the Thunder God himself. Hills have been formed, people have laid upon them, but some misattribute the origin point of Lady Thor, Jane Foster, and place it far later than it truly was in a way. While Jane Foster would become Thor in the Marvel Universe, the main verse, the 616, after an extended mystery arc following Marvel's 2014 event Original Sin, for some there was no mystery at all because they were aware of this origin point. For while the execution had changed, the idea of Jane Foster as Thor had already been done. The concept of a female Thor, specifically Jane, dates back to the 1970s and Marvel What If. The What If series was originated as a way to play with alternate universe concepts, things too far from the main canon but potentially still fun to explore and play with, perhaps even dive into some fan questions or even creator ones. Over time, some of those concepts have found their way into the main Marvel Universe. The origin of Thordis is a fascinating one. It brings together many classic Thor stories while also highlighting that even then there was a bit of a struggle surrounding who is Thor. And not necessarily because of the female aspect, but because of the convoluted history surrounding Thor, his hammer, Donald Blake, and his secret identity. So get ready for a story that is going to smack you in the face with an out of nowhere romance at the end. You're not ready. It's not Loki and Jane. That would make too much sense after how much she was thirsting over him when she first saw him. Loki, mm, a lovely name, and he seems so dashing and romantic. Okay, let's do it. I almost clapped and then realized we'd be way too loud. What if Jane Foster had found the Hammer of Thor was the 10th issue of the first continuous run of Marvel's What If series and was released in 1978. It was written by Don Glutt with art by Rick Hoberg, inks by Dave Hunt, colors by Carl Gafford, and letters by Carol Lay. By the sacred beard of Odin. Thordis can take care of herself. Thordis really is the female version of the name Thor. It means Thor's goddess. It also does follow the Thor trend of the hero's name just being a name and not some kind of call sign. You gotta break it up like Thunderstrike. Eric came up with a name for himself because when the name is also the hero name, it again kind of furthers that blurring of the lines as to what is what. Will you lay eyes on our startling shock ending? Not everything needs to be shocking. Some things, but not all things. We open on the Watcher partaking in one of his favorite pastimes, watching things play out differently in alternate universes. In these tales, the star is typically a retelling of the original happenings, so that one who is perhaps not familiar with them can be caught up and they can still enjoy the tale, but it can also be a refresher course for those who are familiar, so that not only can they pick up the differences, but they'll know which canon is in play, because sometimes the origins have been tweaked or changed slightly. The origin of Thor was first told in Journey into Mystery 83, in the year 1962, where Dr. Donald Blake was on vacation in Norway and suddenly sees some aliens from Saturn land. In fleeing from them, he falls down a cliff, has to hide in a cave, and in that cave finds the magic walking stick that is actually the hammer of Thor. And upon striking it on the ground, he gains the powers of Thor. Whosoever holds this hammer, if he be worthy, shall possess the power of Thor. This inscription is going to be at the center of contention at various points. Now while it does say he, the language being employed at the time, the conventions such as they were, and in some cases still are, language is ever changing and evolving, it's being used in the more classic sense, as a blanket term for everyone or mankind. It's more in the form of a plural they than a he is and specifically a he male, a specific dude. Some find this kind of use of gendered language problematic, others don't. Now the hammer itself, Mjolnir, is Thor's, and they are trying to tie it back to Norse mythology. But the thing with early Marvel history was a lot of it was evolving on the fly. So Thor's origin, along with many of the other characters, would evolve and be tweaked as it went. So the retelling in this what if is going to condense a lot of what happened. It's going to jump straight to Donald Blake was Thor in human form sent to Earth by Odin as a punishment for not being humble enough, which is also why Odin gave him a limp, which is slightly problematic. It's a shame that word has become so overused and co-opted because at times it's the perfect descriptor for certain situations, but now also conjures up all kinds of baggage at the same time. It itself in some ways has become problematic at the time of this recording. It's come full circle. <laughs> Originally Donald Blake was a person and then he got the powers of Thor. Then he became actual Thor, so it was almost as if they were two separate people. There was also a period of time where he wouldn't fully remember what he did as Thor, and then they would become the same person via retcon. Later they'd be sort of separated again and Blake would be a severed head, and many years later Marvel would go full edge and make Donald Blake a thing again and a serial killer, cuz. Okay, so that was what happened the first time, but in this universe we're operating under the canon that Blake is Thor but he doesn't know it yet, and once again he's gone on vacation to Norway but this time not by himself. He's gone with his love interest and nurse, Jane Foster. 
nurse, she works for him, not his personal nurse. Jane is on this trip because she really likes Dr. Blake, but it's 1978, so she's waiting for him to make the first move, which he's not doing because he has extremely low self-esteem. He's got a lot of internalized doubt issues because of his leg, and he's convinced that she won't want him and that he has nothing to offer her. Their thought bubbles are very dramatic and sad. Maybe he's just using his lameness as an excuse so he doesn't have to admit how he feels towards me. If only I could tell her how much I love her, but, but a woman so beautiful could never love a cripple. This trip is very depressing. This is also an example of one of the glories of thought bubbles. They can allow the situation to become so much more charged and nuanced because we now have this intimate insider knowledge of each of these characters' motivations. It also allows some of the other plot elements to be dealt with. For example, Jane does work for Dr. Blake, which would have been viewed as less of a thing at the time, but we know that he's not taking advantage of her or his position because of these thought bubbles. Without them, it would be much more open to interpretation, which some would argue it still is. Which you could, but the point is, Thought bubbles. Thought bubbles and Don's internalized self-hatred. He also is worried that if he told her how he felt, she would quit and he would never see her again, which yes, valid concern. But enough about all that, aliens. The two get separated and it's Jane who falls off the cliff into the cave and finds the staff. She tries to use the staff she finds in there to leverage her way out because she's trapped because of the trick door she found. But just like in the original, she can't move it. So in frustration, she bangs it against the rock, which triggers the transformation. And she gets transformed. Taller, buffer, Blonder. My clothes have been replaced by this costume, like something out of an earlier age, but this is impossible. She then reads the hammer and realizes, oh, I've got Thor powers now. Obviously, if I've got Thor's powers now, I'm not really Jane Foster. No, wait, stop. It's that kind of line of reasoning that leads to confusion. She should still consider herself Jane. She's just Jane with powers. She still remembers everything about being Jane. She doesn't have a new personality or new memories or anything like that. She just has powers. Taller, blonder, buffer. Get a hero name, yeah, for sure, but she's not a different person. It's more as though she now can adopt a persona to match these powers. And the phrasing is probably not meant to be read so literally or pedantically. It's more likely meant to come across a bit flippantly as, oh, I'm different now. But with the confusion surrounding Thor and how confused characters are going to be in this story, it doesn't help. Also, the hammer is very unspecific about what makes one worthy. So why could she pick it up? Because she could. There are so many questions surrounding this hammer. Like why did Odin think that Thor would ever even find it? What if Thor never found it? Was he just gonna let him die down there? Did he really think that there was no potential that anybody else could ever find it. Even when you got into the cave, there was a trick door. So you had to find the cave and the trick door. There were so many layers. Because of all this, it really does make it come across like what makes Thor Thor is Thor's abilities and not necessarily his personality. It's probably not intentional, but that is a read that one can take away from something like this. This story has some very interesting layers that one can ponder. Jean decides to call herself Thordis because she knew a Norwegian girl in college who had that name and she liked it. If you suddenly found yourself decked out with powers, would you just pick someone's name as your hero handle? With this outfit, I probably have gone for the name Valkyrie. Yes, it's taken, but look at that outfit. Jane is delighted with her new powers. Now, having studied some mythology, quickly figures out some of the things she can do. It's not very intuitive how she figures out that she can spin the hammer to fly, but she figures it out. Sorry, it's 1978. Throw the hammer. Because she figures this out so quickly, she's able to go and save Dawn from those Saturn rock monsters. Thordis, but you know my name. I don't understand. Wait, the woman I love is down in those caves. Can, can you? So he finally admits it, but to someone else. Don't worry about Jane right now. She's in the safest place on earth. That extra emphasis on Jane after Blake didn't say her name and just said the woman I love. Oof. Say her name. This encounter does not lessen Jane's love for Dawn, but it does hurt it and dampen it slightly. Dampen is not lessen, they're different things. She's hurt because he hasn't told her he loves her, but he'll tell some random superhero. And even when they're reunited, he still doesn't. She's disappointed, but now we must move on. We're just gonna leave that by the wayside and not pick it up again until the very end. So, okay, we did that. Now, how does the universe progress? Why, let's introduce Loki. So, we jump to a revamp of Journey into Mystery number 85, where Loki first appeared, freeing himself from the tree he was trapped in with one mission. Mess with Thor, because Loki is bitter and petty. Ah, there is the mighty Thunder God. He is on Earth, in a hospital, entertaining children. He always did have a soft spot towards all. Except me. Making your rival entertaining children at the hospital about yourself, god to your narcissism. So Loki sets about making mischief on Earth to summon Thor. Jane slips away to use the magic stick that she turned into a hairbrush so it would be less conspicuous and more portable. This change does work. I, however, would be terrified of doing anything to a magic stick that I found that gave me superpowers. How could you know that it would still work if you cut it or did anything to it? 
Not worth the risk. By Orden's beard, though, that attires the Thunder Gods, that shapely beauty is not Thor. Despite having just said that that shapely beauty is not Thor, Loki proceeds to go on as if it is Thor. Greetings, Thoris. It has been a long time, hasn't it? You see, this here, this is why people can get confused. Him acting like this makes it seem like the hammer was what contained Thor's personality and essence, not just his powers. But they didn't really. It's more like Blake could access those memories while he held the hammer. They made it more complicated than they had to. There is much here that I too do not understand, like how my brother is now more my sister. Perhaps during my ages of imprisonment, Odin managed to sire a daughter. Or perhaps Brother Thor has become the victim of a sinister spell. Whatever the reason, whoever wields the power of Thor is enemy to Loki. That seems super impractical and like a really big missed opportunity. You know, to trick her and mess with her mind, then try to figure out whether she's Thor or not. Because he was looking for Thor specifically. How will it be as satisfying if it's just revenge on a person who has Thor's powers? But no, they fight. And Jane has read enough mythology to know Loki bad. He does not succeed. No way, Loki. The hammer is mine now and I'm keeping it. She throws him all the way back to Asgard, so he has to quickly formulate a new plan. I bear great tidings of thy true son, my liege. There is some evidence of Odin's A-plus parenting right there. Now cleverly here, Loki does not lie. He says that Thor's powers have manifested on Midgard, which is true. That is what has happened. Odin assumes that this must mean that Thor found the hammer. So he summons him, or tries to. What he ends up doing is reaching out to Jane in her dreams, and she follows the summons once she wakes up. And she just struts in like she owns the place. It's kind of great. I can't believe what I'm seeing. Everything around me is so so magnificent. Sif is keenly waiting, for she dreams of marrying Thor. Is it Thor, my liege? He who bounced me on his knee when I was but a child? Wait a minute! The garb be the same, Lady Sif, yet his gait appears strangely amiss. Ah, Odin noticed the shapely strut. You're obviously the king of these uh, gods. You must be Odin. Thor? Why does no one know how the hammer works? I summoned my son, not some Valkyrie in Thor's raiment. Raiment is a woefully underutilized word. And no, you did not. You summoned the hammer and it came. Nay, in thy hand is the enchanted Mjolnir, yet none save Thor himself may hold the mystic mallet. Listen, if that's what was wanted, then they should have been more specific on the inscription and with the curse or spell or whatever it is. Enchantment. Just have it say, if you're not Thor, this isn't your hammer. Don't try. And then if they try, they turn to ash or something. So we then get a recap of Odin's plan as it was revealed in Thor 159's where it was revealed the gasp that Donald Blake was actually Thor for realsies. Which was kind of meant to solve the problem of wasn't Thor co-opting some random man's life? Because he kind of was. And then that's what they revisit way later on. He says that he sent him down to learn humility. But how is that supposed to guarantee he found the cave? Oh, so humble. Time to book a flight to Norway. Thus doth Odin now have but one son. Loki. This is why Loki has issues. The Warriors 3 proceed to be gross, mostly Fandral. True Asgard would glitter yet more with thy golden beauty, but twill be at the side of dashing Fandral. Together shall we find some secluded spot and- What? No rich man's imitation of Errol Flynn is gonna pick me up. So even a god is discount Errol Flynn? Behold, Lady Sif, her power is equal to that of mighty Thor. I remember when he had to flip Fandral to stop him from propositioning him. Odin banishes Thordis reasons and she's perfectly fine with that. Sif, however, is very upset. Here she was patiently aging, waiting for Thor. Boo, she's gonna take action eventually, later on, not right now. Thordis is going through a montage of Thor's greatest hits with so many editor's notes attached, it feels like editor Roy Thomas had zero confidence the reader had read any Thor ever. It is nice though, cause you know exactly where to go in case you are confused. Thordis joins the Avengers and she likes them, but she should probably stay pretty far away from Giant Man. I like these Avengers. They don't get intimidated by my powers, especially considering I'm a woman. Take that. Was giant man, giant high pockets. Just what are you gawking at? Uh, did you say something, honey? Iron Man has nothing to say. He's too busy thinking. In fact, why don't we disband while we have the chance? Woo! Brought it back. You thought it was gone, but it came back. Odin has been watching Thordis, and while he is impressed and does need to go into the Odin sleep, he's not gonna make himself look bad by unbanishing her. Sif is done with this, so she leaves to seek out the real Thor, Donald Blake. He's doing what he's been doing this whole issue, beating himself up. Him and Jane have drifted apart because she's so busy being Thordis. Not that he knows that, he just knows that they've drifted. And now it's all, oh, I should have told her I loved her when I had the chance, whereas before it was, she could never love me. His lamentations are halted when he hears a woman seemingly drowning and springs into action. Can't move too fast with his bad leg, but I've got to try. He gets to her, and then the scene goes in a direction that may not have been the strongest narratively for Don's character. Miles will vary. It feels 
feels like it's building to his act of heroism triggering the memory that he is Thor. But no, Sif just confusingly creeps on him. Confusing for him, not for her. I knew thou wouldst not leave me to perish, my love. Mm, now follow that up with how you sat on his knee as a child. She then heals his leg, she says as a reward for saving her. Which, while a nice thing to do for him, also ends up reinforcing the story's whole he was given the permanent injury as a punishment angle. It was 1978, so there are different conventions surrounding the feelings surrounding injury, and those feelings can also vary amongst individuals as well. If the lesson was that Don was going to have to accept himself as he was in order to achieve true humility, putting aside however one may or may not feel about that, this story rather undoes that because Donald learns nothing here. He meets a beautiful woman who cures his leg and then goes on adventures. Unless the lesson is be good or dad will punish me and send me to earth for years with a very flimsy plan that could fail in a great number of ways. Why Odin make him a doctor when he dropped him on earth? He dropped him right at the university. There are much more humbling origins. Sif transforms before him and says she's a goddess and she loves him. You're certainly the most beautiful woman I've ever encountered. Jane? Jane who? I don't recall. But why would a goddess be in love with me? I beg thee, Don. Ask no more, but take me in thine arms. He doesn't need to be told twice. Strange vibes, because she's getting with Dawn, but Dawn is Thor, but doesn't remember that, and that's who she really wants. It's just, it's a lot. Back in Asgard, they were watching Thordis. Could they also spy on Dawn? Did they ever? Because how else did Sif find him? She found him really fast. Did they just watch him and take bets as to whether or not he was ever going to find this cave? A wild Loki appears and injures Sif, but Dawn is powered by goddess embraces now, so he tackles him from behind and smothers his face with his jacket. And this act of heroism triggers his memories and he becomes Th No, it doesn't. Loki slams him into a wall and Thordis has to come save him. I'd hope to destroy Thor's spirit by destroying his mortal form. Oh, so now it matters that it has to actually be Thor. But does it count as a proper soul crushing if he doesn't know that he He's Thor. So Loki's decided that he's gonna just destroy both now. The person with the powers and mortal Thor. He has to flee though and regroup. And now Thordis must face the pain that Dawn loves another. Cause she still loved him. Even though we didn't talk about that for this whole issue, but she did. Ironic, because of his lameness, Dawn was afraid to love Jane Foster. And now that he's cured, he seems to have found someone else. Ironic is not the word I would use. Jane x Thor or Sif x Thor used to be a pretty big shipping battle back in the day. Jane x Sif? I mean, did Jane bounce Sif on her knee as a child? Dr. Blake is able to save Sif's life through surgery. That comics code approved injury was very serious. Imagine there was blood everywhere. They bond over this because they take it as a we healed each other kind of moment, which is sweet, but it all feels very, very rushed because she met him and healed him about two seconds flat. Loki is annoyed. Nothing is working. None of his plans are working. And when that happens, just full Ragnarok. Control alt delete. Sometimes you just gotta start again. I wanna go to Asgard Thordis to fight Sif's side or to die with her. That's intense, but kind of sweet. Anyway, it's time for the squad to go to Asgard. That's some slang that died hard. You would think Odin would have a better backup plan for during his Odin sleep than Thor, especially after he banished him. Thordis and Sif secure a magic sword for Dawn, which is pretty neat. Now he just needs some kind of uniform so they can come correct. Magic, swords, Norse gods. I should be stunned by all this, but for some reason, I'm not. Probably because you live in the Marvel Universe. They don't get a chance to really wreak any havoc though, because Odin wakes up and deals with it. But Dawn does manage to corner Loki with the sword. Curse you! Even in this form, you- We are running out of time though. We gotta get to that shocking conclusion. We can't waste any more panels on Loki. They just say that he's banished in a little narration box on top of one of the other panels. In the aftermath, Odin asks Thordis to give him Mjolnir. She is reluctant, but he says she misunderstands him. He thinks she's a valiant hero, but it is decreed by fate that the hammer belongs to Thor. Then why just leave it in a cave and say that anybody who was worthy could pick it up? This of course causes her to transform back into Jane in front of Donald. He's stunned, but he's about to be way more stunned when in about two seconds he remembers that he's Thor. Now Donald Blake, grasp ye the mystic mallet. But a mortal can't hold. Jane just spent this whole issue holding it. You just saw her D transform. Clearly a mortal can hold it. Don't give it to Donald. My memory, it's returning. How could you do this to me, father? Odin says that he has earned the right to once more call himself the Thunder God. He has? Okay. I mean, he did wield a mystic sword and corner Loki. I guess we don't have very high standards. That means it's time for the startling ending. Odin apologizes to Jane by giving her godhood, making her a goddess, and giving her, in my opinion, a pretty sweet outfit. But Thor loves Sif not Jane. It tracks. He barely had a relationship with Jane as Dawn in this universe, and his Thor memories are far more numerous of Sif. I won't bring up the knee thing again, but I'm thinking it. Jane is devastated to the point where she doesn't even think she wants to be a goddess for what good is eternity no one to spend it with. But that won't happen. And no, Jane is not going to eventually heal and come to love her godhood, maybe even get back to heroing because it was something she was enjoying and was good at. No, period typical romance is coming for her. Just thank the stars it's not with Fandral. Deny thyself the love of yet another who had lived perhaps too long. 
without a woman at his side. Am I to understand what you're saying to me, sire? Is Almighty Odin proposing to me? Has Odin ever been known to jest? She wouldn't know that because she doesn't know you. There's also an editor's note here to explain that in this universe, Odin is single because he wasn't at this point in the 616. They say proposal, but he does court her for some time so that they can get to know each other before she becomes queen of all the gods. Is that Odin's wedding garb? It's pretty fantastic. And so they all lived happily ever after. I don't know why my hands were fists for that. <laughs> now this ending, is quite random. And it does fall into the we must pair people off kind of mindset, but there does seem to be a method to this madness in that Jane loses Thor to Sif, hence by following the pairing off logic, loses her happy ending. So she needs to be compensated because she was a hero and she spent the whole issue being heroic. There's no need for her to be punished with singledom. So she needs someone better, a step up, an improvement, someone to make up for the fact that she can't have Thor. So they go from a prince to a king kind of deal. It's meant to be like an upgrade. It still feels quite random. But one can tell it is partially there for the shock value. I mean, they put that on the cover. There were several other outcomes here that could have been quite interesting to explore and perhaps equally shocking, but they would also have perhaps altered the status quo more than was wanted or was contemplated at the time. The least altering one is Jane attains godhood, doesn't end up with Thor, and that's fine. This would be the truly shocking for the conventions of the times. She goes on to just live her life and be a hero and be okay not being immediately paired off. If one wanted to see the potential eventual future romance, they still could. Have her make eye contact with somebody in a panel. Oh wow, they looked at each other and breathed the same oxygen, the sparks. It'll be enough for people who are goggle inclined, trust me. They'll put them on. Another possibility, but this one would have been more invasive to the story as was laid out. Jane gets to keep the hammer. In a truly humbling experience, the activities and being in Asgard trigger Thor's memories. And he's now a truly mortal man, who while his godhood may be restored to him at some point, has lost the hammer. And with it the opportunity to be the hero of legend to the people of man because of his youthful hubris. You could have him keep the magic sword and perhaps have him seek to forge a new hero identity. Or maybe he doesn't become that kind of hero again at all, deciding that he already is one for all the work he does on earth as a doctor. Who does he end up with? Again, it's up for options. That one's fun because it could go a bunch of places and you could also really expand it. Now, some wacky ones. Surprise, twist, shocking ending. In fighting her, Loki comes to love her and they get married. Boom, twist central. Take that, Odin. There be no real reason for Odin to be against it either because she has the power of Thor and then she can defend the Odin sleep and just, oh, oh, he would see the mega twist. Her and Sif run off together and Thor and Odin need to confront his poor parenting super ultra twist. Sif decides that maybe she wants to rethink the whole just sitting around waiting thing and you know, maybe it's her turn to be evil and she marries Loki. I mean, if we're just gonna have surprise marriages be the shock, why not? This what if, while a classic, is not the strongest one out there. It starts off with a decent concept for a what if, a mantle swap. Somebody close to the hero taking on their role, a la what if Rick Jones was the Hulk. However, the idea as the story progresses begins to lose focus and proves itself to be a stronger concept than actually being executed. It starts to come across as Jane Foster is Thor. Okay, now what? This feeling is achieved by having so many Thor plots referenced but completely breezed through and given little weight, while an overall threat takes most of the issue to come to the fore and then is dealt with within a few pages. This one has a lot of editor's notes and moments meant to make the reader go, remember when this happened with Thor? Well, now it's happening again, but with Jade. The conflict and romance between Thordis and Dawn is pretty much just dropped and then awkwardly picked up again at story's end. It feels quite clear what pairing this story supports. The story, while having some strong and interesting concepts, doesn't spend a lot of time on those moments, instead hurtling past them, so at times it feels like events are occurring in a cliff-noted form. The story at points also doesn't seem clear on how it wants to classify Thor, with characters being confused as to whether Jane should or should not be considered Thor since she has the hammer. With all that said, this story is an entertaining one but perhaps not always for the intended reasons. The characterizations are strong in that each of the characters do feel distinct, and Jane as Thordis is positioned in a fun way in the story because of her disconnect with Blake and the story not wanting to damsel him over much, in that she comes across as quite independent and loving the superhero life, even though she would like to share it with Dawn. In fact, the story kind of stops focusing on the concept of a female Thor. But in all fairness, the story wasn't what if Jane Foster was Thor, it was what if Jane Foster found the hammer of Thor, which does open yourself up to other branches and for other characters to have their place inside that story. The whole concept of expecting someone to pick up the hammer and the wrong person picking it up is fun for a bit, but as a storytelling device, it needs more to back it up long term, which isn't necessarily a problem here because this is a one shot. I've heard tales, though they may be apocryphal, that at the time, the story was mocked with the phrasing, what if Thor had t 
tits. Which, vulgarity aside, does do this story a disservice, as it is more than that. But it never goes as far as it could, and very much does get bogged down following the trajectory of canonical Thor stories. Rather than venturing off the beaten path, like a what if the Fantastic Four had different powers, or a what if Spider-Man became a sleazy Hollywood producer, that's my title, not theirs. There was a fun concept here, and different people have been Thor since. So it's not surprising this idea was revisited for the main verse eventually. Parts of that are just as awkward as parts of this were. They at least translated that part of the vibe. And the world is set to become more aware of her or some version of her thanks to Thor, Love and Thunder, time recording unreleased. But those are just my thoughts and I want to hear yours. Do you wildly disagree and think this is a very strong what if? Where do you land on the Thor title or person question? Do you think part of that debate stems from the very nature of Thor's origins themselves? Do you like Thoris or Lady Thor as a name or something else entirely? Thoughts on the shocking ending? Yes, I want to know many things. Throw some shocking marriages at me in case I missed some. I'm sure I did. Thor marries Loki. <laughs> Tell me things down below. And while you're down there, please follow YouTube things. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell notification so that you never miss a vid. Thanks so much for taking us by our day spent sketching comics with me. I always appreciate it. I will see you again soon. Bye-bye.